our planet is very old. And when we think of the things that we know of today, the life that we're used to seeing, whether it be flowering uh, plants or you know, the diverse animals that exist, um, when one studies fossils, uh, you realize uh, these are rather new in the fossil record. Uh, our planet was dead for um, about a billion years. And then for uh, about 1.5 billion years, about a third of the history of life, this area here in red, um, the only life on Earth were the bacteria. Protus uh, uh, lived alongside these uh, prokaryotes uh, for another billion years before the first animals uh, appeared. When animals did appear, they were certainly not the animals of uh, today, the first animals of the Ediacaran uh, period. Um, uh, they were uh, rather simple. They were sponges, cnidarians, and uh, worms. If we're going to study the history of vertebrates, uh, out of the eons of Earth, uh, we have to look only at the most recent eon, which takes the past uh, 540 million years. So if we were to split the Earth's history into eons, it is the Phanerozoic eon, which occupies the last 540 uh, million years. And that is when animals uh, get uh, to be much more diverse. Um, and it is also at this point where we get the first vertebrates. And in the class that I teach on comparative vertebrate anatomy, um, I'm doing uh, an introductory uh, series of lectures just talking about vertebrate uh, history, as I covered in the previous uh, uh, video. Uh, vertebrates first get their start in the Cambrian uh, with fish like these, which were only an inch or two long. They had no jaws, no bone, no pectoral and pelvic uh, fins. And so both the chordate ancestors of these fish and these first vertebrates, they start in uh, the Cambrian. And then if you were to look at the history of uh, these uh, these fish as uh, they go, I'm sorry, as uh, time uh, progresses, we realize that many organisms are limited to specific time periods, just as, you know, the Egyptian pharaohs or the Ming dynasty or the Huns uh, or the Mayans or the revolutionary, you know, uh, war on the colonists are, um, uh, limited to a specific time in recent human history, so too are these animals. And so there were diverse jawless fish, which only exist in the uh, Ordovician and uh, the uh, Silurian uh, times. Uh, there uh, was a, uh, a group of uh, jawed uh, fish uh, known as uh, the placoderms. Uh, these were the most primitive uh, jawed fish. They become extinct in um, the end of the Devonian period. So if we were to look at the eras of the Phanerozoic Eon, the old life of the Paleozoic era, the middle life of the Mesozoic era, and the uh, recent life of the Cenozoic era, um, there are organisms like these uh, jawed fish, the placoderms, which have uh, are limited to a specific uh, time uh, period. Um, uh, the group of bony fish, uh, which were closely related to the uh, amphibians, uh, they are limited in uh, time. Um, and so uh, by the end of the Devonian, it was from these Ripidisti and Sarcopterygian fish that the first amphibians uh, had uh, evolved. Now, um, one of the things that's happening in uh, the background, uh, before I get back into uh, the first uh, reptiles, is that there are lots of changes going uh, on on the planets, uh, some of uh, which is resulting in uh, mass extinctions. So continents are moving. Uh, so the Earth does not look the way that it does uh, today physically. And when vertebrates started, there was a fusion of the southern continents known as Gondwana. And that these were moving towards each other by the end of the uh, Devonian. Now, for the first 200 million years of vertebrate history, the only vertebrates are fish. So all vertebrate life occurs in water um, up until 
uh, 350 million years ago. Um, but for a number of reasons, there are, are lots of advantages of adapting to land. Um, one of which was that there was this narrow seaway which connected the uh, land uh, masses, uh, which was uh, fusing starting in the late uh, Devonian, but some of this would continue um, uh, into uh, the Permian period, it would be gradual as uh, Africa um, uh, collided and uh, started uh, mountain uh, ranges um, uh, here. Uh, and so uh, there would be a series of mass uh, extinctions which would affect uh, all vertebrates, uh, but especially these new vertebrates on land. So that's something that's you know just going on in the background. I'm not going to deal with it extensively, uh, but the continents coming uh, uh, together of uh, is a factor in uh, the mass extinctions of the Devonian uh, through uh, the Permian. In the Triassic, the continents will now start to separate again, and a mass extinction occurs at the end of the Triassic as the um, as uh, the um, Atlantic Ocean uh, begins uh, to uh, form. As continents move, uh, you know, there are changes uh, obviously in, in temperature and other, um, and other things. Uh, one of the things that which occurs uh, during the time of the first reptiles is an ice age. Uh, so ice at the poles is a rather uh, unusual thing. I know we're used to ice in the Arctic Ocean and ice in Antarctica, but most of the history of uh, life has not had um, uh, temperatures as cold as they are now, nor ice at uh, poles. And this probably affected um, the, uh, uh, the distribution of uh, uh, water uh, and uh, the heat of the planet uh, through uh, currents. So, um, the time of the, uh, the first amphibians, the late Devonian, is significant um, because uh, our planet had never known forests before, right? So land plants had taken, you know, hundreds of millions of years uh, to develop vascular tissue, et cetera. But by the end of the Devonian, finally, there were the first forests and the Carboniferous uh, being named after the carbon deposits uh, in uh, coal, uh, which would develop from that period, uh, the planet um, uh, was uh, changing. That plus the movement of these uh, continents, perhaps restricting water flow as the continents fused, leads to um, an uh, glaciation, um, which will peak in the late Carboniferous and early um, and early uh, Permian uh, periods, uh, and so. Uh, the late Devonian helps give rise to amphibians which are better adapted to living on uh, land, uh, which we call amniotes. Amniotes uh, would be the uh, would be reptiles, birds, and mammals. Um, and so uh, vertebrates adapt to life on land for the first time in the uh, amniotes. This occurs in the late uh, Devonian uh, period. Um, but by the early Carboniferous, the next uh, period, we get uh, amniotes. And uh, there are so many anatomical features that amniotes share. And so uh, birds, reptiles, and uh, mammals, uh, they share features of you know, their uh, nervous system, their skeletal system, their muscular system that amphibians uh, lack. Um, importantly, if you look here, amphibians today still lead kind of like a double life. They need to spend part of their time in water. Typically, reproduction occurs uh, uh, in water. Many eggs are laid in water, and there is an, um, uh, there is an aquatic larval stage. Um, but notice these snakes. These are water snakes. Clearly, they're comfortable in water, but they are mating on land. Uh, as you see here, uh, they will lay their eggs on land because of a number of uh, changes, uh, not only of uh, the reproductive uh, system, um, but also of these membranes which surround uh, the embryo, what are known as extra embryonic uh, membranes. Things like the chorion, the amnion, 
uh, the uh, Alain choice. And so in the early Carboniferous period, there is a new group of um, vertebrates on uh, Earth, which now have an amnion and are adapted to uh, better live on a land in terrestrial environments, perhaps in part spurred by what used to be low level coast swamps um, was now becoming uh, elevated uh, dry mountain ranges as continents co collided and elevated this land. And so by the early Carboniferous uh, period, uh, our uh, planet had amniotes. Um, now, these would have been reptiles uh, at first. Uh, birds would not originate until the uh, mid-Mesozoic and mammals just before that. And so uh, the amniotes uh, first arise in the uh, Carboniferous uh, period. There had been no reptile on Earth prior uh, to uh, that. Now, at this time, there were certainly giant amphibians, um, but the very first amniotes, these first reptiles, uh, they were rather small. They would get bigger over time, but all of the earliest uh, reptiles are, you know, a foot long or less. They would have been small insect eaters. Later, they get big, all right, among other things, um, reptiles. So here we see, you know, uh, some of the uh, early uh, uh, some of the early uh, am, uh, amniotes, uh, these are uh, small uh, reptiles. Uh, later, they would get bigger because reptiles are the first vertebrates to figure out that you can eat plants. We know today that the things that eat plants can get big. Elephants are big, you know, moose are big, buffalo are big, giraffes are big. And reptiles are the first to figure that out, that by eating plants, something that amphibians really don't adapt uh, to do, uh, that one can reach considerable size, which then also then allows for larger predators to prey on these uh, herbivores. Um, and so uh, reptiles then become quite successful over long periods of time, you know, including you know, these huge uh, herbivorous forms. Now, um, because uh, there are so many uh, reptiles, uh, we need to uh, start breaking them into uh, groups. And the earliest reptiles are missing an opening in the temporal region of the skull uh, that uh, will allow their jaw muscles to, you know, uh, go from the lower jaw up uh, through the opening to the skull where they could be longer. So this pereosaur, uh, this giant herbivore, it's missing that opening. It's called an anapsid reptile, literally lacking the, uh, the hole. These are anapsid uh, reptiles. Anapsid reptiles are the earliest reptiles, so they appear in the uh, Carboniferous. Um, but for the most part, they are gone by the Permian, the end of the Permian period. The end of the Permian uh, period uh, had certainly seen a lot of challenges to life, so that you know the fusion of the continents was a slow, gradual process completed by the uh, Permian. The uh, late Paleozoic Ice Age peaked earlier in the Permian. And at the end of the Permian, there was a volcanic eruption, the most severe in the history of our planet, which probably lasted for a million years, dumping um, uh, millions of cubic kilometers of uh, lava. And uh, together, uh, at the end of the Permian, uh, this caused the worst mass extinction in the history of our uh, planet. So much so that we use it to mark the boundary between, say, the old life of the Paleozoic and the middle life of the Mesozoic. After the Permian extinction is over, life starts anew, as I'll get to. There are dinosaurs, there are mammals, there are, are birds shortly in the aftermath of um, uh, this mass Permian extinction. And at that point, then the anapsid uh, reptiles are largely um, uh, extinct. Um, however, uh, there is something which personally uh, bothers me um, um, because I, I need to mention uh, where modern amnio groups originate. So I'd like to talk about turtles. Where do turtles come from? Now, um, the answer is there have been two answers 
in, uh, in recent time that uh, biologists have uh, supported. And some have said, look at this evidence, it supports this model, look at this evidence, supports this model. Now, it frustrates me uh, that uh, there is not consensus and there seems to be consensus and the new you know, studies are uh, reported, which then seem to support something different. But I'd like, I would like to stress that that's how science works. As we study the natural world, um, we will never have all of the answers. We simply hope to get closer and closer to an accurate depiction of it. And there are times where uh, what uh, conclusions of the past, you know, get uh, retested, and uh, we may find that there are uh, new solutions. New fossils are found. Um, uh, up until a couple decades ago, uh, genetic sequences weren't really used to uh, determine which were the best groupings of uh, vertebrates. Um, but now that um, uh, is commonplace. But then here's a question: What? happens if the genetic analysis seems to support one grouping of life's groups, whereas anatomy seems to support a different one. Well, the best answer is you, you go back and you try to you know, test more. Um, and so turtles, when they first appear in the fossil record, they are missing an opening uh, in the temporal region of the skull. They are an apsids. Um, but then the question arises, was that a, did they have openings and then lose them? In which case they started so they weren't truly an at the beginning and then they were just modified afterwards. So there have been uh, models uh, claiming that uh, turtles are an reptiles or they are diapsids, which I'll get to. Um, if they are an that was the earlier consensus, um, but um, the later uh, uh, evidence uh, is tends to be supporting the alternate idea of diapsids. Um, uh, then they would be the last living members of the first reptile group, the anapsids. Uh, so uh, turtles uh, are you know, best recognized for their shell, among other features, uh, which is essentially uh, composed of thick ribs fused to bones in the skin, um, uh, known as dermal bone. Uh, the very first turtles of the Triassic period, this would be right after that mass uh, Permian extinction, um, they had uh, uh, bones in the skin on their underside. They had a plastron, but they didn't have uh, a carapace a portion of their shell. And they were primitive in many other ways. They had teeth, for example. Later turtles uh, would have um, a complete uh, shell, um, but here later in the uh, uh, Triassic uh, forms like Proganochelys, um, they clearly weren't you know, the turtles of today. It's an extinct group. The bones are different. They still have teeth on the roof of their mouth, uh, etc. And so then here's a key that even when turtles um, exist, so not only has most of Earth's history passed without any turtles, when turtles first appear, they are not the turtles of today. In fact, the turtles, which we often think of those which can pull their uh, next inside their shell, what are called the cryptodires. Uh, they're the second group uh, of modern turtles to appear in the Cretaceous period. In the Jurassic period, um, there was uh, a group which could not uh, uh, retract their necks inside their shells. And we still have turtles um, in this group alive today, the pleurodires. And so today there are both pleurodire turtles, which cannot retract uh, their necks, and cryptodire turtles, uh, which uh, can. And um, our turtle uh, uh, groups evolve slowly over time. Now, once again, uh, one could make the argument that because they're missing a hole in this region, that these were anapsid reptiles. Um, but uh, some of uh, the genetic analyses uh, seems to uh, support um, something uh, different. Uh, so uh, the turtle uh, origins are uh, a bit, uh, there's evidence on um, both uh, signs. And so once again, this is you know, perhaps a good uh, analysis of how science starts. All right? One never feels that one definitely knows the answer to a question in science. You know, one continually then you know, has to go back and examine new evidence. From the first anapsid reptiles, which either largely or completely become extinct in the uh, end of Permian exterior, uh, uh, extinction, there are no temporal openings uh, here. Um, uh, two groups of reptiles uh, evolve, uh, which have openings in the skull, which allow the jaw muscles to lengthen and then to attach uh, here. So it gives them a stronger bite. 
Um, there are diapsids, which have two holes, and there are synapsids, which have one hole. Uh, the synapsid reptiles are quite diverse for a very long time. There are pelicosaurs and therapsids. They become major herbivores, major predators. They have this synapsid opening of uh, the skull. But in the end, the Permian extinction, uh, the majority of the lineages become extinct, including these. Now, you might notice that this, while it's a reptile, is looking rather mammalian. You know, it kind of looks dog-like. Um, and that's because the, from these pelicosaur reptiles would come the first uh, mammals uh, by the uh, Triassic period. So while many of the synapsid reptiles became extinct in the end of permanent extinction, one group called the Cynodonts uh, survives into the Triassic uh, and they become more and uh, more uh, mammal-like until uh, by uh, the late uh, Triassic, uh, we have the first uh, primitive uh, mammals. Now, I'll like to mention mammals in the next part of this vertebrate history, um, but uh, while mammals first evolve in the Triassic period, over the Jurassic period and the Cretaceous period, you could ask, what do they do? Um, they don't accomplish a great deal. It's not until a meteorite hits uh, the world at the end of the Cretaceous uh, period that wipes out the dinosaurs that then mammals um, and mammals truly come into their own and diversify into the lineages which we have uh, today. So I'll get back to uh, synapsid uh, reptiles. Um, but uh, the point is, if we were to follow the history of the amniotes, um, different groups have lived uh, at uh, different times. And in all of them, we see, you know, there is this uh, you know, modification over time, then the modern forms do not exist from the very beginning. Um, from the first anapsid reptiles, by the late Carboniferous, there are diapsid reptiles. Now, these diapsids, perhaps they aren't that impressive at first. They're small, just like the first reptiles uh, were uh, small. But the diapsids uh, would dominate terrestrial environments for 200 million uh, years. And so uh, clearly they have a great potential uh, in them. Now, there are so many groups of reptiles that just to address them, we should you know, break them into groups. You know, I already have mentioned that there are the anapsids, the first reptiles, the synapsids, which would lead to mammals, and then the diapsids. Um, and then the diapsids, they will split into, split into different lineages. One lineage we can call the uh, lipidosaurs, um, and uh, these uh, lipidosaurs, um, I hear, I'm sorry, this is a crocodile. You can see it has those two openings. So that's a diapsid. Um, but uh, the uh, diapsid split into a number of lineages. Some will actually adapt to life uh, in aquatic environments, as I'll get to, and uh, become a diversity of aquatic uh, uh, reptiles. Um, but of the lineages which uh, survive uh, to today, we have um, lipidosaurs and archosaurs. Now, lipidosaurs are perhaps best signified by the lizards, and lizards uh, would potentially be the oldest of the groups of diapsids. We could argue whether by the Permian we have true lizards or just the ancestors of lizards, and so you can argue on, whether, on how you like to classify them, but um, lizards are an old uh, uh, group, and certainly they diversify into a large number of uh, forms. Now, even modern lizards are, you know, quite um, uh, diverse. Uh, but once again, uh, they uh, potentially, depending on how you uh, classify lipidosaurs versus, uh, I, I'm, I'm sorry, um, uh, these lizard-like ones, in, uh, as opposed to lizards, uh, could be either at the very end of the Paleozoic or the beginning of the uh, Mesozoic. Um, I'll get back to lizards in a second. Uh, there was another group which looks like lizard-like uh, called the rhinocephalians. Um, they had a number of lineages. Some were, you know, large herbivores. Uh, some actually um, lived in um, aquatic. Uh, environment. So there were ocean-going uh, rhinocephalians, um, and they became extinct except for one, which is alive today, the Tuatara. 
So the lepidosaurs today uh, have given us the lizards and snakes, the worm lizards, which is another group I'll mention in a second, but then this other lineage, the Tuatara of New Zealand, it is the last living uh, remnant of uh, its uh, group. Um, so once again, lipid, uh, the uh, lizards, they are ancient and they are quite diverse, some of which are huge, uh, like the Komodo dragon, which had uh, larger uh, cousins in uh, the past. Um, and lizards then included uh, a group known as mosasaurs, which actually adapted uh, to life in uh, the ocean. Uh, and so uh, the ocean uh, in the Mesozoic era was full, you know, had predators like, you know, 40 and 50 foot long um, uh, lizards swimming in the ocean as, uh, as predators. It was uh, in the late Cretaceous then that uh, the first snakes evolved. Now, there have been a number of lineages of lizards which have lost their legs and become legless. There are legless lizards. There's another group called the worm lizards. They are legless except for one of the, the subgroups still has its forearms for burrowing. Um, but other than that, it's a legless group of uh, lizards uh, which evolved from uh, lizards with legs. And the same is true then of snakes. Uh, there is, um, are fossil snakes which show this transition. Uh, there is one fossil snake uh, known which still had arms um, and uh, several known which had uh, legs. Um, and so uh, it was these uh, snakes which evolved late in the Mesozoic uh, era. And once again, went through a series of uh, transitions where you know, these legs were uh, gradually lost. This is what's known as a worm lizard. Uh, it is uh, related uh, to lizards. It's descended from uh, lizards, um, but uh, they are legless except for one group which still has remnants of uh, their, uh, uh, their uh, four legs that they use uh, for burrowing. Uh, and so um, out of these lepidosaurs, uh, there are a number of groups which exist in uh, the fossil uh, a record, and then there are uh, lineages which have uh, survived uh, till today. And that's one of the purposes, you know, of you know uh, this uh, history uh, discussion to kind of uh, give the uh, the origins of modern uh, of modern uh, groups of uh, of vertebrates. Lizards are far more diverse than many people uh, give them, uh, you know, credit for. And so, if you were to study their uh, anatomy and their other traits, it becomes obvious that not all lizards are closely related to each other. This is an ancient lineage that has then, you know, uh, broken into a family uh, tree. And so, in addition to the fossil forms, which included giant marine uh, uh, predators, uh, etc., uh, there are um, diversity of uh, lizards alive uh, today. Some have lost uh, their legs, uh, uh, some uh, can actually uh, produce uh, venom. And so um, uh, the uh, lizards, which represent uh, a, a suborder, have then uh, produced uh, you know, separate uh, families, genera, uh, and uh, species. And we actually refer to the group as being what's called paraphyletic. Paraphyletic means when you say a lizard, that's not a real good, really good biological term because worm lizards are actually modified lizards, but we kind of consider them a separate group. And snakes are modified lizards. And so if you look at the family tree of lizards, you can see how many groups there are. Um, but notice that within the family tree are these worm lizards, even though we keep them you know, as a separate group very often, they are just as much in this family tree as all of these others. And these worm lizards are more closely related to these lizards than these lizards are to these lizards. And so, um, you know, just by saying, here's a lizard, here's a worm lizard, here's a snake, you think that there are three different groups. But once again, lizards are very diverse. These lizards are not that close related to these lizards. They are closely related to the worm lizards. And in the same way, there are lizards more closely related to snakes than they are to these uh, lizards. So lizards are a paraphyletic uh, group. Uh, they have 
uh, given rise uh, to uh, legless uh, uh, forms. And we can find anatomical evidence of that today. You know, primitive snakes still have spurs. Uh, there's a number of other uh, features that lizards and snakes uh, share. Um, but uh, the fact that the first um, snakes all had remnants of legs, and there's one even known that had the remnant, uh, remnants of arms, uh, this, uh, you know, gives testament uh, to uh, that. Okay. Um, so they're rilipidosaurs. Uh, as I had mentioned, some of the uh, lineages um, uh, early in diapsid history uh, adapted to life in uh, the water. And at first, you know, they're, you know, a foot long, three feet long. Um, but then from these lineages, uh, we get these enormous marine uh, reptiles. Um, now, they would be reaching, you know, their height of sorts in the Triassic period. So after the mass extinction at the end of the Permian, um, we get the very first ichthyosaurs, um, which get to uh, enormous uh, lengths. Um, but uh, the mass extinction that occurs at the end of the Triassic then wipes a lot of these out. So notice, you know, this one's more than 60 feet long. Um, so uh, these aquatic reptiles, they uh, do uh, very well, but, you know, they, they get a big uh, push after the end Permian extinctions. Many of them are wiped out in the end Triassic uh, extinctions as the continent starts to separate. And over these tens and uh, hundreds of millions of years that some of the lineages persist, you can observe that what starts off with a fairly basic body plan with arms and legs adapted, you know, uh, to walking on land, that there are duplications of the bones of the digits uh, and so that uh, over time, they develop bodies which are uh, more adapted to marine life um, and, you know, their limbs have become uh, flippers. Uh, and so there are lots of lineages uh, here. Uh, there are the ichthyosaurs, um, which uh, those that survive the end Triassic extinction then have a, a rather dolphin-like uh, body shape and they are uh, you know, common during uh, the uh, Mesozoic, uh, the uh, later Mesozoic era. And uh, there are other lineages uh, as well, uh, such as uh, uh, these uh, plesiosaurs, uh, which lengthen their, uh, which uh, lengthen their necks and um, uh, become dominant marine uh, predators. Uh, some of these, you know, approaching uh, 50 feet in, uh, uh, in length. Once again, we see gradual transitions where the number of vertebrae in the necks gradually uh, increase, uh, the limbs gradually become more uh, flipper-like, uh, etc. And so, uh, once again, there's just this diversity of uh, these uh, reptile groups, which now have hundreds of millions of years to adapt to the world and to change after mass uh, extinctions. Um, the group which includes many of the reptiles we know best from the fossil uh, record and, and you know, is still alive today, are what are called the archosaurs, the ruling reptiles. The word arch means to rule. So an arch enemy is not any old enemy. It's you know, a, a chief of among the enemies. And so as the Paleozoic reptiles then diversify, one group of the late Paleozoic become uh, archosaurs. Now, at first, you know, they're small. I mean, this one's six feet long, so, you know, I guess that's uh, big uh, enough. But after the mass extinctions of the Permian, uh, then these ruling reptiles, they produce so many lineages. They produce the flying uh, pterosaurs, the first vertebrates to fly. Um, they produce, you know, uh, lots of a dominant a terrestrial uh, uh, predators. Uh, they produce uh, crocodiles. Um, here we see, uh, you know, forms uh, on land, which are, uh, you know, 20 feet uh, long. And uh, then they produce the dinosaurs. Now, these would be diapsids. So as we watch, you know, the lineage leading to Tyrannosaurus rex evolving, here you can see there are these two temporal openings for jaw muscles. So these are diapsids. Um, but once again, the subset of the diapsids 
called the archosaurs or the ruling reptiles. Now, as I'll get to in the, I'll mention now, but I'll get to in the final um, a part of uh, this uh, series, the uh, uh, of the lineages of dinosaurs, one group um, evolves into birds. And so birds would then not only be diapsid reptile descendants, but also archosaurs. So the archosaurs, which begin their history in um, the late uh, Paleozoic, uh, then give us uh, a diversity of lineages, including the crocodiles and birds, which are still alive today, but then dinosaurs and pterosaurs and other extinct uh, forms. So the Mesozoic era is sometimes called the age of uh, reptiles. Uh, and, you know, just reptiles have so many adap adaptations, including, you know, some becoming uh, the second group of vertebrates uh, to fly in uh, the birds, as I will uh, mention. Obviously, this age of reptiles um, uh, uh, suffered uh, in the extinctions of the end Cretaceous period 65 million years ago, um, which were caused uh, by continental movements, especially uh, India, as it left the southern continents and started to move towards Asia, had the second largest volcanic eruptions in Earth's history, which affected the climate. And then a meteorite uh, came and hit the Yucatan uh, Peninsula. Uh, these two events uh, together uh, drastically changed um, uh, uh, life on Earth and gave opportunity to the mammals uh, to uh, adapt. Um, but I, I'd like to just kind of sum up uh, these uh, archosaurs. So the uh, archosaurs of the Permian, so notice, you know, here's a smaller uh, form, maybe, you know, some getting to maybe six uh, feet long. They survive the mass extinction at the end of the Permian. And then by the time the Mesozoic era begins, uh, this group is now well placed to, you know, adapt to terrestrial environments. Uh, so the anapsid reptiles are gone. The synapsid reptiles are mostly gone. And so it is then these diapsids uh, which then adapt to uh, this uh, new world. And there's lots of lineages. So the early Triassic uh, is when the first crocodiles arise. Although they aren't the crocodiles of uh, today, just like turtles evolved slowly over time as these other groups, so too did uh, the crocodiles. Uh, the early crocodiles were small. Uh, they were rather lightly built. Some were even bipedal. Um, and so crocodiles would go through several lineages. Uh, the early uh, crocodiles of the Triassic, uh, they would uh, become uh, extinct. Um, uh, once again, there were mass extinctions at the end of the Triassic. Uh, then the Jurassic and Cretaceous would have a great diversity of what are known as Mesosuchian crocodiles including some forms which were, you know, as long as the longest predatory dinosaurs and far heavier. And so uh, uh, crocodiles uh, would uh, have uh, a, a rich diversity in the Mesozoic before there were the modern crocodiles. And then there were groups which look like crocodiles, but which weren't. So here, for example, you see a phytosaur. It looks like a crocodile, but if you look when it came to the surface, um, its nostrils were not at the tip of its nose, but rather here, which probably gave it an advantage. So it could probably um, then uh, float with far less of its uh, head exposed. And that would undoubtedly help it uh, sneak up on, uh, on prey. Uh, other uh, reptiles here look like crocodiles, uh, but which aren't. These are known as the Rauwasukians. And so in the Triassic period, these archosaurs, they truly do come to rule. Uh, but a lot of the, the groups aren't even the dinosaurs. Actually, the dinosaurs, they really become firmly established after the end Triassic uh, extinction. And so these ruling reptiles evolve a number of forms in the Triassic period. And these early uh, dinosaurs had company, right? So notice, you know, here are some which are nine feet long, and then there are some which are actually uh, much longer than that, 15, even 20 feet uh, long. These are not dinosaurs. These are just uh, giant predatory um, archosaur uh, 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 reptiles. Uh, 
Uh, so once again, uh, of this mix, uh, most become extinct. There were armored adasaurs, which also become extinct. But we still do have crocodiles. Now here's an early crocodile, maybe a foot long. Uh, notice how different it seems uh, from modern uh, uh, crocodiles. Um, but that is a surviving uh, lineage uh, today. Also in the Triassic, one group of uh, archosaurs lengthens the length of its fourth finger. So if you were to say compare the arm of a human, a basic reptile, and this pterosaur, um, you would notice that all the arm bones are pretty much the same. Okay, so there's one wrist bone, which gets a bit of an extension in the pterosaur. Um, but what really makes um, these pterosaurs uh, unique is that uh, their fourth finger gets uh, greatly lengthened, and then a membrane runs from the fourth uh, finger uh, to uh, the sides of uh, their body, forming a wing. So uh, here then in the Triassic uh, period, uh, vertebrates fly for the first time. Now, there may have been gliding lizard-like reptiles uh, in the uh, uh, in uh, uh, the Paleozoic at the end, and certainly there were um, uh, different uh, gliding reptiles of uh, uh, the Mesozoic, uh, just like there are gliding reptiles today. Even some snakes can flatten their body and glide. There are gliding squirrels and marsupials and frogs. Um, but uh, the pterosaurs were the first group of vertebrates to actually fly, thanks to this greatly lengthened uh, fourth um, finger. Um, like all of the groups, they don't, didn't all appear at once, they evolved slowly over time. The first pterosaurs uh, were the rampharynchoid uh, group. They tended to be smaller, um, they uh, typically had uh, tails, uh, they kept their uh, uh, teeth. Um, the uh, later forms were much larger, uh, very often lacked uh, tails, and many of which uh, had lost uh, their uh, teeth. And so uh, the pterosaurs, they go through uh, groups. They certainly had advantages when they began, because if you can fly, this then allowed you to fish, all right? So you could capture fish from above, something that vertebrates had not been able to do uh, before. You could uh, catch flying insects, you know, prior to that. Flying insects had not had any um, had not had any predators. Uh, so there were certainly advantages in flight. Those rampharynchoids, however, their, uh, their success is not uh, permanent because by the middle of the Mesozoic, there are birds. And apparently birds then offered competition to these rampharynchoids. And so like a shorter wing covered with feathers seemingly has advantage over this long wing membrane, which would be vulnerable to say insect parasites, which could get scratched with branches uh, and the like. But by the middle of the Mesozoic, another group of pterosaurs is evolving uh, the pterodactyls. And some of these could have uh, wingspans um, of uh, 20 feet and some up to uh, 40 feet. They probably were more likely to be found uh, near coasts and they would have flown more by uh, gliding uh, using air pockets, you know, to, uh, to soar um, uh, like, uh, you know, eagles and vultures do. And so while the rampharynchoids probably flew more by flapping, uh, these largest of uh, the pterosaurs probably flew more by soaring. So the Triassic period um, gives us the first mammals, which I'll talk about in the next uh, uh, series. Uh, it, it gives uh, the first uh, turtles, and it gives the first uh, crocodiles, um, and uh, uh, all of, uh, sorry, I forgot that this was a longer one. That was weird. Uh, so, um, and then it also gives us the first dinosaurs. Now, um, dinosaurs uh, are only known during the Mesozoic era. They start in the Triassic, uh, but then last through the Jurassic and uh, the uh, Cretaceous. 
And before there were dinosaurs, there were reptiles called dinosauromorphs. Uh, so there were archosaurs, uh, which slowly developed into dinosaurs. Dinosaurs are a family tree. And there are different lineages, which would become um, more and more uh, dinosaur uh, like. And so what really marks the first dinosaurs is their hips, uh, their legs, and their ankles. And if we look at, you know, those features of the hips with the pubic bone projecting forward and the um, ischium projecting uh, backwards, uh, when we look at the very modified ankle uh, that um, uh, dinosaurs uh, have, uh, these traits evolved uh, slowly. Uh, and so, uh, the Triassic, um, uh, in addition to having the very first uh, dinosaurs, has these uh, dinosaur morphs, uh, which are the ancestors and relatives of dinosaurs, which gradually develop uh, the changes of the legs, hip, and ankle, um, uh, which gives uh, to the dinosaurs such uh, success. All of the first dinosaurs at the beginning, at the middle of the Triassic, were small. The big ones come later. They were bipedal. The, you know, some dinosaurs were quadrupedal, but they come later. And they were rather unspecialized. And so um, while, you know, dinosaurs, you know, could get long-necked, you know, giants or uh, uh, animals with armor and horns, they come later. And so from those small uh, bipedal dinosaur morphs, uh, small bipedal dinosaurs uh, evolve. We split the dinosaurs into two big groups um, on a number of features. The, the one that gives it its name is uh, the uh, hip. Uh, so uh, there are Saurischian uh, dinosaurs um, with, quote, the lizard uh, hip, uh, where the pubic bone projects uh, forward um, uh, here uh, in blue. And while they look the same in the Triassic period, so if you look at say a, a Triassic theropod versus a Triassic prosauropod, um, they look very similar. As these two lineages evolve over time in the Jurassic, there are lots of different um, uh, uh, predatory dinosaurs, and then also those very long-necked uh, sauropod um, uh, dinosaurs, which uh, were uh, giant uh, herbivores. A second group of uh, dinosaurs had a number of features which mark them. The pubic bone uh, rotated uh, backwards, and then also then there were some other uh, changes of the skull, like, you know, uh, of the, uh, there's a predentary bone at the front of the, the jaw, for example. Uh, these are called the ornithischian uh, dinosaurs. And then this lineage looks like this at first, small, bipedal, rather simple. But then as the Mesozoic progresses, uh, this uh, group uh, evolves into uh, different uh, lineages, um, uh, which would include uh, the armored, um, uh, the armored uh, dinosaurs, the uh, uh, hadrosaurs, uh, the horned dinosaurs, uh, and the headbutting pachycephalosaurs. And so um, all of the dinosaurs start off as small bipedal forms, all right? So dinosaurs begin looking like this, um, but then uh, they divide in the Triassic into Saurischian and Ornithischian forms. And then over the you know, uh, remaining Mesozoic era, uh, from the Saurischians, we get the meat-eating theropods and the long-necked herbivorous uh, sauropods. And then there are, uh, among the ornithicians, there are armored dinosaurs, there are hadrosaurs and duck-billed dinosaurs, uh, I'm sorry, hadrosaurs and other ornithopods. Uh, there are the head-budding pachycephalosaurs and the horned uh, ceratopsians. Um, so like all of these lineages, uh, they certainly did not, uh, you know, all, uh, you know, appear at once fully formed. You know, they uh, changed over uh, these tens of uh, millions of uh, years. Now, uh, just a couple of uh, uh, final uh, points. Um, these reptiles were certainly affected by mass extinctions. Remember that there was a mass extinction at the end of the Triassic period. And many of those other groups of predatory reptiles die at that point. And in the aftermath 
uh, dinosaurs become uh, abundant. And so, you know, arguably dinosaurs owe part of their success to the end Triassic mass uh, extinction. Um, it should be remembered that all of these organisms had specific moments in time that they uh, existed. So for example, uh, these are meat-eating dinosaurs. They did not all coexist at the same time. There are some meat-eating dinosaurs which lived in the Triassic period, like Eoraptor. There are some which lived in the Jurassic period. There are some which lived at the beginning of the Cretaceous. There are some that lived at the end of the Cretaceous. So for example, Tyrannosaurus rex was only known in the last 5 million years of the Cretaceous. Most dinosaurs never uh, encountered a Tyrannosaurus rex, which only lived at a specific period of time and only in Western uh, North, uh, uh, North uh, America. Now, in the uh, last version of um, uh, the uh, history of vertebrates, I'm going to uh, focus on the Cenozoic, but I'd like to, you know, I'll begin that with a few thoughts on birds. And it then becomes relevant that, you know, some of the dinosaurs uh, had modified their scales to become feather-like. And so that while a number of dinosaurs apparently use this for camouflage or for ornamentation um, or for, you know, keeping warm, uh, that, uh, these feathers could then be modified for gliding and uh, for flight as would uh, uh, occur in the birds which are descended from dinosaurs. And so at the end of the Cretaceous period, most lineages of dinosaurs uh, become um, extinct, uh, although um, birds would be one final uh, dinosaur um, a dinosaur uh, lineage uh, which did survive. And so in the Carboniferous period, a new group evolved, the amniotes. And amniotes would dominate uh, not only terrestrial, but also uh, marine habitats, you know, for hundreds of uh, millions of uh, years. Uh, the movement of continents and mass extinctions would certainly be significant in uh, their various lineages because some lineages would die uh, in a mass extinction and others get a, a start in the aftermath uh, of it. Um, and the amnios, which we refer to as uh, reptiles, certainly diversified into many uh, fossil groups and gave us uh, the turtles today, which are either modified diapsids from the beginning or the last surviving anapsids. They give us lizards and then two groups which have uh, descended from lizards, worm lizards and snakes. They've given us another group of lipidosaurs, the um, tuatara, which is uh, alive in New Zealand uh, today. And then from those ruling reptiles, the dinosaurs are largely extinct, the pterosaurs are extinct, um, but the crocodiles uh, have survived uh, until uh, today, as uh, did uh, the birds. So the end Cretaceous extinction um, wiped out most of life on Earth, um, but did not wipe out um, some lineages of birds which would uh, uh, survive. Um, and uh, the, um, uh, the Yusukian crocodiles, so the early uh, groups of crocodiles became extinct, the Mesosukian groups of crocodiles became uh, extinct. Um, but the uh, Yusukian uh, uh, crocodiles, uh, they survived uh, the mass extinction uh, to give us uh, the groups of today. And so if you're trying to study the vertebrates of today, their history is uh, relevant because uh, you know, this explains uh, the diversity of groups which we have today, but also then we observe the traits of our modern groups evolving slowly over uh, uh, steps. Certainly the first crocodiles uh, were uh, not like modern crocodiles, just as the first birds were not like modern birds. The first lizards and snakes were not like uh, modern uh, forms. So in the final uh, of these three uh, videos, uh, I'll focus on uh, the mammals and the birds uh, and largely on the Cenozoic uh, era, uh, the most uh, recent of the eras of the Phanerozoic uh, yeah.